Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you here today. I am a climate scientist. I study how climate change affects the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, the water we drink, and all of our infrastructure on which our lives depend. I write reports for the National Academy of Science and the National Climate Assessment. But one thing that you won't read in my scientific bio is the reason why I'm a climate scientist. I am a climate scientist because I'm a Christian. How did that happen? Well, I grew up in a home where science was front and center. This is a picture of my sister and I when we were little, and if you look in the background, you can see something. That's a telescope. That telescope went everywhere with us. In fact, our family vacations were planned around astronomical events. <laughs> because my dad was a science teacher. But along with the science, we learned, growing up in a Christian home, that the Holy Scriptures are God's written word, and creation is God's expressed word. And we see this directly in the Bible, for example, in the book of John, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and through him all things were made. So what is science other than studying God's creation? So it's no surprise that as I grew up and went to university, here's a picture of me when I was in university, I started studying astronomy and physics. And in fact, what you're looking at there on my t-shirt is um, the development of galaxies. Yes, that was a thoroughly nerdy science t-shirt. <laughs> but what I want you to notice in this picture is not what I'm wearing, but rather what the background is showing. In the background, you can see that I'm not in my home country of Canada. I'm in a different place, the country of Colombia, where we moved to when I was nine years old, where my parents served as missionaries for a number of years. And growing up in Colombia, You see the world in a different way, and many of you have that experience growing up in a country that is not the United States or Canada. You see that when disasters strike, when you're living in a home that's made out of tied cardboard boxes that you collected or a few bricks that you were able to purchase, when disaster strikes, it can be devastating. When drought, when rainfall, when storms hit, thousands of lives are lost. Hundreds of thousands of homes are destroyed. And so when I was studying astronomy and physics, I needed an extra class to finish my undergraduate degree. And this is a, this is a endorsement of having to take a breadth requirement because I had already finished all my physics classes and I looked around and there was a brand new class on climate change. I thought, well, that looks interesting. Why not take it? So I took this climate change class and it completely changed my perspective. In that class, I learned that climate change is a threat multiplier. It is the hole in the bucket. Whatever issue we're concerned about, whether it's poverty, whether it's biodiversity loss, whether it's hunger, whether it's injustice, whatever issue we're concerned about, climate change is making it worse. And I learned that these impacts affect us all, but they don't affect us all equally. If we look at the natural environment around us, headlines just from the past year show that salmon are getting cooked, and they don't mean it to eat, by climate change. 65% of the insects on Earth to go become extinct. Climate change is a top threat to biodiversity. And when I connected this with what I believed, the connection is clear. In the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, in chapter 1, it says, God spoke and said, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature so that. Did you know that there's a reason there? We learn in Sunday school that we were created in God's image, but there's a reason for it, and that reason is very clear, so that we can be responsible for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. This is our God-given responsibility. And when we look at the headlines today, 
we are not fulfilling that responsibility. We see the same message in the Doctrine and Covenants. For it is expedient that I, the Lord, should make every man accountable as a steward. This is where stewardship comes from, as a steward over earthly blessings which I have made and prepared for my creatures. So it's clear that everything around us comes from God, but we have a special role to play in taking care of those resources. When we say living things, we often think of plants and animals, right? But we're living things too. And when we look at who is most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, as I learned in that class, it's clear that the countries where people live off one or two dollars a day, the countries where people don't have enough food to give their children at night, the countries where people don't have a safe place to live, those are the countries that are most impacted by a changing climate. And that speaks directly to what we believe as well, doesn't it? When we see the headlines, Climate change made the deadly floods in Pakistan worse that displaced 30 million people. Child marriages are on the rise as the drought crisis intensifies. Why? Because when you have a choice of your entire family starving to death or marrying off a daughter at the age of 8 or 10, some parents are called to do the unthinkable. And climate change is making droughts worse. It's even making people more poor. We've seen this already, and this connects directly to what's in our hearts, because we believe that we are to be recognized by our love for others, and how loving is it for us to say, oh, that's not my problem, when people are losing their homes, they're losing their sources of food, they're losing their fields and their farms and their crops, they're even losing their families. We're supposed to be recognized by our love for others. And we're supposed to be teaching each other to love one another and to serve one another. But when we look around the world today, we see that that's not happening. Since the 1960s, we've seen, for example, that climate-fueled disasters have increased the economic gap between the richest and poorest countries in the world by as much as 25% already. And so I asked myself, taking that class, learning about the science, but filtering that science through the lens of my faith, I asked myself, what is climate change other than a failure to love? So that's what made me decide to become a climate scientist. Now, let me back up a minute, because you might be thinking, or you might know someone who's thinking, hang on, is she talking about global warming here? And yes, I am. I am talking about the average increase in the temperature of the planet from the 1900s to where we are in the 2010s. But what I'm talking about even more is the impacts of this and why it matters. But we live in a world, we live in a country, where this simple phrase is currently, and has been for over 15 years, at the top of the list of the most politically polarized issues in the country. Today, the number one reason for people to agree, or the number one predictor of whether people agree with the simple statement that the planet is warming and humans are responsible, is not how educated we are, it's not how much science we know, it's not how smart we are. It is simply where we fall on the political spectrum. But a thermometer doesn't give us a different answer depending on how we vote. And God's creation is clearly giving us a message that we scientists have been studying for a very long time. How long do you think scientists have been studying this issue, if you had to guess? We've been studying it since the 1800s. By the 1850s, scientists understood that the planet was warming and that humans had a role. But we didn't just automatically assume it had to be humans. And this is part of what I learned studying this issue. We said, we know that climate has changed in the past. We know that natural cycles, changes in energy from the sun, volcanic eruptions, have caused climate to change in the past for entirely natural causes that have nothing to do with humans. So why do we think what's happening today is our responsibility? 
This is an important question that science can help us answer. So when we look at these natural factors, let's start with the sun. We know that over time, the sun's energy gets a little brighter and a little dimmer, and then the earth gets a little warmer and a little cooler, sort of like when you turn up the dimmer on a lamp. So could we be getting warmer because of the sun? Well, when we look at the sun's energy, it turns out, no, it's actually been going down the last 50 years, not up. So according to the sun, we should have been getting a little bit cooler, but we're getting warmer faster and faster. So then people say, well, what about natural cycles? Could it be natural cycles? But what they fail to understand is that natural cycles don't create heat out of nowhere. All they do is they move heat around the climate system from east to west, north to south, ocean to atmosphere and back again. And today, we don't see one part of the world getting warmer. We see the whole thing getting warmer. That's how we know it can't be a natural cycle. What about volcanoes? You might have heard someone say, I hear this frequently, especially on the internet, one volcanic eruption produces more pollution than humans do in 30 years. Well, it turns out that volcanic eruptions produce a lot of particles that get up there into the upper atmosphere that act like an umbrella reflecting the sun's energy back to space. And so volcanic eruptions actually cool the earth, they don't warm it. So you can see a kind of a common theme here, right? According to the sun, we should be getting cooler. According to natural cycles, it just all evens out. According to volcanoes, we should be getting cooler, but we're getting warmer faster and faster. How is that happening? Well, it all started back in the 1700s when we figured out how to dig massive amounts of coal back then, and today more oil and gas out of the ground and burn it, producing heat-trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. And just like you would if someone stuck into your room at night and put an extra blanket on you that you didn't need, you'd wake up sweating saying, hey, I didn't need this blanket. In the same way, our planet is heating up because we are wrapping an extra blanket around it that it didn't need. And we've known this since the 1850s. But then people might say, okay, so there's an extra blanket and the world's getting warmer, but it's only warmed by, you know, 1.1 degrees Celsius or almost two degrees Fahrenheit. That's nothing. I mean, there's a bigger temperature difference in here to outside than two degrees. But what we fail to realize is that the temperature of the entire planet over the history of human civilization on this planet has been as stable as that of the human body. Over the course of human civilization, our temperature has gone up and down by a few tenths of a degree, just like your body temperature goes up and down by a few tenths of a degree over the course of a day if you measure it. But what happens if your body temperature goes up by two degrees? You feel achy, you might take some medicine, you might consider calling the doctor, you don't feel well. And that's exactly what's happening to our planet. It is running a fever, and we are seeing the symptoms of that fever all around us. So we as humans can't add up the temperature at every weather station around the world in our head and figure out, oh yes, it is going up. So even though this issue is called global warming, what I prefer to call it is what we humans see, what we humans experience here where we live. So rather than calling it global warming, I call it global weirding. Why do I call it that? Well, a couple of years ago, I was standing in line uh, to pick my son up from Sunday school after church, and the man behind me said, do you mind if I ask you a question? Sure, I said. I mean, we're standing there anyways. Why not? He said, do you feel like the weather has gotten weirder? And I thought about it for a second. I said, yes, I do feel like the weather has gotten weirder. In fact, I don't just feel like it. I know it has. And he said, I knew it. I've lived here in West Texas for 30 years, he said, and I can tell that something is different. It is not the same as it used to be. It is getting weirder. And so I thought to myself, isn't that the perfect description of what we see happening? Whether you live here in Provo, whether you live in Salt Lake City, whether you're from a different part of the world, don't you feel like things are getting weirder? Well, they are. And let me explain exactly why and how. So this is what I also learned when I studied the science, that wherever we live, it's as if we have a set of weather dice. 
And we always have a chance of rolling a double six, a drought, a storm, a heat wave, a wildfire. We've had these types of extreme events forever, naturally, right? I live in Texas where we had the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. This picture was taken not very far north of where I lived for many years in Lubbock, Texas. Also in Texas, they had the Galveston hurricane, which remains the deadliest hurricane to hit the United States because people didn't know it was coming and so they couldn't get out of the way. And that was in 1900. So you might say, okay, so these terrible things happened before. Where does climate change come in? Well, it comes in because we have these natural weather dice and we always have a chance of rolling that double six. But as the world gets warmer decade by decade, it's sort of as if climate change is sneaking in and taking one of the numbers on this dice and turning it into another six. And then it's taking another number, turning it into a six, and then it's taking one of the numbers and turning it into a seven. And then they're saying, hey, I live in the city of Houston and we just had three 500-year flood events in three years? That's not a 500-year flood event if you have one a year. That's global weirding. And that is exactly what we're seeing around the world. Storms, floods, droughts, hurricanes, they're all naturally occurring events, but they're being supersized in a warmer world. Let's take hurricanes. Where do they get their energy from? They get their energy from warm ocean water, and so do typhoons and cyclones. Same storm, different names, depending on where you are in the world. Remember I talked about how we have that extra blanket we're wrapping around the planet? Over 90% of the heat being trapped by that extra blanket is going into the ocean. And guess what that heat's doing in the ocean? It is powering stronger storms. Have you ever taken a hair dryer from the US over to Europe and plugged it in? If you haven't, don't. <laughs> Bad idea. Why? Because there's a lot more current over there and it will fry your hair dryer. Well, that's exactly what we're doing with hurricanes. Hurricanes are plugged into the ocean and there's so much more heat in the ocean today than there was 50 or 100 years ago. What do you think is happening to the hurricanes? They're getting stronger. They're intensifying faster. They're dropping way more rain on us than they used to 50 or 100 years ago. That's global weirding. What about floods? We've always had floods, but warmer air holds more water vapor. And so when a storm comes along today, as it always does, there's more water vapor for that storm to sweep up and dump on us than there was 50 or 100 years ago. That's why floods are getting worse. What about droughts? You might say, hey, you can't have your cake too. I mean, floods and droughts, they're both getting worse? Yes, why is that? Well, what if a storm doesn't come along? Then more water is evaporating, but it's not being dumped on us. And so the hotter it gets, the more we have these high pressure systems that direct storms away from us. And so when a drought comes, our droughts are stronger and longer than they used to be. So you get all your rain dumped on you, and then you get a drought, and then you get rain, and then you get drought. And that's the opposite of what we want for our water resources, for our food and our crops. And then there's wildfires burning greater area. Now, most of the wildfires in the US are the result of accidental human ignition. Somebody leaves something plugged in in the shed they shouldn't have. Somebody dumps a load of burning trash into the dry brush, which they shouldn't have. Somebody sets off gender reveal party fireworks during a drought, which they shouldn't have. <laughs> These are all real examples, in case you're wondering. So where does climate change come in? Well, imagine that you drop a match into a pile of green, wet wood. What happens? Not much, right? Imagine if you drop a match into a pile of bone-dry kindling that's been baking in record-hot temperatures for days. A huge fire. That's where climate change comes in, and that's why we're seeing that our wildfires are burning greater area. In the 1980s, across the whole United States, there was on average one new weather or climate-related disaster every four months. So every four months in the 1980s, we would have a big disaster, a hurricane, a wildfire, a big drought. By the 2010s, we were having one every three weeks. And this map that you see behind me is a map of all the extreme events around the world that have caused loss of life, 
loss of homes, loss of crops, that have been shown to have been made worse by climate change. Did climate change create these events? No. But did it make them worse, more dangerous, more damaging, more devastating? Yes. And so you can see when I learned this, I thought to myself again, what is climate change other than a failure to love? Because these disasters affect us. They literally affect the food that we eat. They affect the water that we drink. They affect the air that we breathe. They affect the buildings and the roads and the systems that we use and that we depend on. They affect every aspect of our lives. And so when people say to me, are you telling us that we need to save the planet? My answer is no. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. Who we need to save is quite literally us. And by us, I mean us humans and all of the living things that share this planet with us that we have a God-given responsibility to care for. Because we cannot orbit the Earth without the resources this Earth provides. How would you breathe without our planet? Where would we get water? What would you eat? And where would God's creation live? So we need our science to tell us that it's real, it's us, and it's serious. And this is what I learned. But what do we do about it? That's where our faith comes in. We need what's in our heart, not just in our head, to tell us why it matters and what we can do about it. And so from the very beginning, when I decided this is what I needed to do, until this very day when I stand before you, I'm convinced that the most important thing we need to do is to connect our heads to our hearts, to connect what we know to why it matters and what we can do about it. And when I do this, I look again to the Bible for guidance. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible has nothing to do with creation, nothing to do with the world, doesn't even have to do with people in general, but it's about our own attitudes and our own responses. The Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy, and he says this. He says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. So often when we hear about these global catastrophes, often fear is a very rational, normal response, right? But fear ultimately paralyzes us. It causes us to act selfishly. And it literally says here, we have not been given a spirit of fear. Instead, we have been given a spirit of power, which means that we're able to act. Power is kind of an old-fashioned word, but today we would say empowered. We don't have to be paralyzed, we can act. How? Out of love, which means we can consider others above ourselves. And as a scientist, my favorite part, with a sound mind. (laughs) So we can look at the information the science gives us and we can make good decisions using our head to inform our heart. So how do we do that? What does our head tell us about what solutions look like that we can then engage with in our heart? Well, the way I like to think about it is using a swimming pool. Probably didn't see that one coming. If you imagine the swimming pool, and we're talking about an above ground swimming pool here, imagine the swimming pool is the atmosphere. And we have a natural level of heat trapping gases in that swimming pool. A natural level of water in the swimming pool that just allows you to touch the bottom with your tiptoes. That natural level of heat trapping gases keeps us at the perfect temperature for life. But at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we stuck a giant hose in the pool and we've been turning it up every year. So what do we have to do? We have to do three things. This is what our head tells us. One, number one, we have to turn off the hose. That just makes sense, right? Number two, our pool has a drain. We have to make that drain bigger. How do we do that? Well, it turns out that nature wants to help. Nature would love to be taking all that carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back in soils and forests where we want it. But we have to do one more thing. The level of water is so high now, our toes don't touch the ground. So we have to learn how to swim, and we have to help others do that too. 
So what do these solutions look like in practical terms? How can we turn off the hose? One way to turn off the hose is through not being so wasteful. We waste 50% of the food we produce, which then decays and produces heat-trapping gases. We waste 67% of the energy that we produce, and we could turn our waste into something we could use. So this is a picture from Africa where they're taking human waste and they're using it to produce biogas to produce energy. We can retrofit our buildings, we can put insulation in our homes, we can make sure that we're not wasting our food, or if we are, with our food waste, we're actually doing something with it and using it. All of these are things we can do to turn off the hose. How else can we turn off the hose? Through clean energy. Did you know that there's 700 million people around the world who don't have access to any form of electricity? And electricity is highly correlated with human well-being. The number one thing that would lift people out of poverty is access to electricity. And after that, access to education. After that, access to health care. So in many countries around the world where these 700 million people live, they don't have coal or gas or oil. But they have a lot of sun and they have a lot of wind. So by turning off the hose, we can also invest in lifting people out of poverty. And that's not just on the other side of the world. We can do that right here as well. Churches, rural communities, even mining facilities are being powered these days by clean energy. So that's the hose. Now let's talk about the drain. How do you make the drain bigger? One of the biggest ways we can make the drain bigger is through protecting and restoring nature. Coastal wetlands, forests, peatlands, anything that grows takes up carbon from the atmosphere. And it provides habitat, and it filters our air, and it cleans our water, and it provides places for us to go and spend time in nature. But it's not only about nature. It turns out that smart farming is also a great way to put carbon back in the soil, where it's an incredible fertilizer. There's so many solutions for every part of what we do that all help with making that drain bigger or turning off the hose. But we also have to help people learn how to swim. What does that mean? We have to build resilience and help them adapt. One of my favorite solutions has to do with cities. As you know, it's getting warmer. Heat waves are getting a lot stronger. I live in Texas where we had days over 100 degrees. And in low-income neighborhoods in big cities, those low-income neighborhoods can be up to 15 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than high-income neighborhoods in the same city thanks to lack of green space and tree cover. And that has a huge impact on people's health and on their power bills. In fact, many people can't even afford to pay their power bills during a heat wave. So one of my favorite solutions is to green low-income neighborhoods. What does that do? Well, it provides tree cover during heat waves that cools down the neighborhood. It also provides green space to soak up floodwaters, because often low-income neighborhoods are located in flood zones because nobody else wants to live there. It provides places for people to go and take their kids and be outside. Those trees filter the air and clean up the air quality, which is usually very poor in low-income neighborhoods because they're located next to highways or factories where nobody else wants to live. And, of course, it provides habitat as well. You can have a pollinator garden. So I love the fact that using nature to help soak up water, prevent flooding, filter our air, cool down our cities, is both learning how to swim and adaptation, but it's also turning off the hose and it's making the drain bigger. I love these win-win-wins, and when we look at climate solutions, there's so many win-win-wins. Our climate solutions can also give us cleaner air and cleaner water. They can also protect us from disasters. They can also improve our physical and our mental health. They can provide more affordable energy, not less. They can reduce our inequalities, create healthy ecosystems and foodscapes, and they can give us a safer world. So why not, right? So here's my last question then. What am I supposed to do about it? I mean, I've talked about a lot of really cool solutions, and you might be able to see how you could lend a hand in these solutions, but what can we do individually is the question. And when this question occurred to me pretty early on, I thought to myself, well, let me think about that. What, what can we do? Well, I know that living in the United States, I use a lot of resources. And I produce a lot of heat-trapping gas emissions, my personal lifestyle. 
It would take two people in China to produce the same amount that one person in the US produces. It would take three people in the UK to produce the same amount of heat trapping gases and waste that somebody in the United States does. It would take eight people in India to produce the same amount as one person here in the US does. You can see where I'm going here. 19, actually 20, 20 people in Nicaragua and 187 people in Malawi, which was one of the poorest countries in the world and the country that is most affected by these global weird and climate disasters. So the obvious thing I thought of was, well, I could step on the carbon scales and I could reduce my emissions. And there's great calculators like this cool carbon calculator from UC Berkeley where you can measure where you live and who you live with and how you travel and what you eat and all those kind of things. It tells you things that you can do personally to reduce your emissions. And every year I adopt two new habits and I don't just adopt them, I share them. I tell people how I'm taking plastic out of the bathroom by using shampoo bars or how we put solar panels on our roof. That's our roof. My colleagues do that too. Garab is a health expert at Harvard and he electrified his house and shared with everybody else how he did that and why. Kim studies coral, and she tells everybody how she bikes to work and what a difference it makes in her life. Scientists are telling people, we need to change how we eat and we need to change how we live. We need to change how we heat and we cool our homes. But as a scientist, I started to crunch the numbers, and here's what I found. All of the choices that we are able to make as individuals in terms of how we live, what we drive, what we eat, how we travel, they only make up about a quarter of the problem. For three quarters of the solutions, we need the system to change. And so I had to confront a really challenging question, which is, how do we change the system? Well, it turns out that our human civilization, our systems, what are they made of? People, right? They're made of people. And then I thought, okay, but how, how can people, how can we as individuals engage? What's the biggest difference that we can make? I don't think it's changing my light bulbs, although I have changed my light bulbs. I don't think it's getting a plug-in car, though I got a plug-in car. How can we as individuals change the system? So I went to a series of polling questions that the Yale Program on Climate Communication asked people, and they asked people questions like, do you think that global warming is happening? And most people say yes, and you can see in Utah County, as well as across the whole US, most people say, yeah, it's happening. And they said, well, do you think it's gonna affect plants and animals? People said, yes, I think it's gonna affect plants and animals. Do you think it's going to affect people who live in the future? Yeah, I think it's going to affect people who live in the future. Do you think it will affect people who live in developing countries? A little bit lighter, but yeah, mostly. And then they asked this question. Do you think it will affect you? And then they asked one more question, and that's where the light bulb went off for me. They said, do you ever, didn't ask if you changed the light bulbs, didn't ask if you eat plant-based burgers, didn't ask if you have solar panels, they said, do you ever talk about it? And that's when the light bulb went off for me. I realized, here's the connection. If you don't talk about something, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you ever do anything about it, right? So I am absolutely convinced that the way we can change the system, every single one of us, is by talking about it. By talking about why it matters to us here and now, and by talking about what the positive things are that we can do to fix it. And the goal of these conversations, as my colleague George Marshall says, is not to shove our opinion on people, not to guilt people, not to scare people. The goal of a conversation is simply to bring people in. How do we do that? Start with something we have in common rather than something that divides us. What do you have in common with people? So I sat down, I did an inventory of myself. Well, I love science so I can start there. I'm a Canadian who lives in Texas. I could definitely start there. I love skiing, and you need snow for skiing. I could start there. 
We got a lot of snow right now. I'm a mom. I can talk to other parents. And I'm a Christian. I can talk to people who share my faith. So then connect the dots to how climate change affects what we both care about. Connect the dots to what's happening where I live in Texas or where you live in Utah. Connect the dots to how climate change is affecting something you love. In my case, skiing. Connect the dots to how climate change is affecting who we love. In my case, my kids. And so that's why I helped found an organization called Science Moms. We let dads in too. <laughs> but most of all, connect the dots to what matters most to us. Why am I a climate scientist? I'm a climate scientist because I'm a Christian. And then, do not forget to tell people what we can do about this. What do solutions look like? And in those solutions, we can talk about what you're doing, or what somebody else is doing that you'd like to do, what your family's doing or what another family's doing that you'd like to do, what your school is doing, or what another school is doing that you think your school should be doing, what your town or your city is doing, what another organization or company is doing, what you've heard somebody doing on the other side of the world that you think you should be doing here too. And I have a lot of resources all aimed at giving you things to start the conversation with. I have a newsletter every week that has a piece of good news, a piece of not so good news because we need to know what's happening, and something you can do. I have my TED talk that talks about how do we start these conversations. I have a global weirding series on YouTube that answers common questions and talks about climate solutions. I wrote a book called Saving Us that's full of amazing ways to start conversations. I even started TikTok with my cat. <laughs> and you know, I'm a little above the age for TikTok, but I am willing to use any tool we have to get the word out. And you know what? You can do it too. And to be totally honest, I'm pretty sure you could do that better than I could, with or without the cat. But guess what? You're already doing that here at BYU. Since the beginning of this semester here at BYU, there's been a talk about climate change initiative. And if you go to BYU Sustainability, you can click and you can add your climate conversation to this map showing the 34,200 conversations about climate change that BYU students have initiated since the beginning of this semester. Every, yes, isn't that amazing? Every one of those conversations is connecting the head to the heart, to the hands, talking about what we can do and why we're doing it. Because here's the bottom line. The bottom line is clear. Caring about God's creation, which includes people and other living things already being affected by climate change today, it is a genuine expression of our faith. It is a faithful acceptance of our responsibility. And it is a true expression of God's love. And I feel like the bottom line is simply that the only thing that counts is when our faith expresses itself through love. So when I think about climate action, when I think about climate conversations, when I think about talking about why this matters and what we can do together, the best way I think about it is it's about loving our global neighbor. Thank you.